In this sermon series, we're studying the wisdom psalms. These lyrical lessons to live by proclaim practical understanding for our daily lives while pointing us to Jesus, the very embodiment of all wisdom. This content comes from Mercy Village Church in Barbersville, West Virginia, and you can learn more at www.mercyvillage.church. All right, birthday parties. Uh, sometimes we'll have the glorious uh, pinata, right? Have ever been at a birthday with a pinata? Okay, good. A few of you have. Okay, so a couple things about the pinata. We still got some kids in the room. That's C R A P candy in the pinata, right? That's always the lamest of the candy. Now, uh, some of them you can pack your yourself. So some people can get a little more ritzy with it if they want to. But if you buy those prepackaged ones, and I mean, no offense if these are your favorite candies, but like the Smarties, right? Nobody's got them at the top, or very few probably have them at the top of the list. Maybe some Laffy Taffy, those little dot things, right? Like who eats, who even eats those? You eat those? Sorry. See, I know it's going to offend somebody. <laughs> it's my own wife, though, so that's, she's pretty used to that. But yet there's this phenomenon that happens at at a birthday party, right? It's lame candy in there, and cake is promised later in the party. Pizza is probably promised later in the party. Gifts are promised. Ice cream is promised. But yet, when that pinata goes up, I don't know if you've ever been at one of these, but I've been, I've seen tears shed over the lame candy that falls out of that pinata. I have seen heads crash together going after the lamb candy that comes out of that pinata. I've got a point for this. We are no different in our souls than those little kids. We might be dissatisfied or clinging after more sophisticated things than those candies from a pinata, but it's in all of our hearts to be dissatisfied. We have a propensity towards dissatisfaction. All of us are so easily Dissatisfied, And never before have we lived in an age where we can have so much at our fingertips. Uh, Amazon Prime set the trend with the two-day shipping, and now a lot of places that you order from will just include that two days. It's at your, your doorstep. We can have whatever we want. Not only that, but for most of us in America, we're living in a time where we are amongst monetarily some of the wealthiest people, regardless of whether we're middle class or lower middle class or whatever, who have ever lived in the world. So we might not have everything we want, but we have access to a lot of things. And yet at the very same time, study after study comes out where they measure people's either what they would deem their quality of life or their satisfaction with life or their happiness scale. And those uh, surveys come back lower and lower and lower. People feel more isolated than ever. People feel less satisfied than ever, less happiness than ever. And at the same time, right, things like uh, the suicide rate is on the rise. It's becoming more and more of a thing. People with this great dissatisfaction with their life to that point of despair. So what's my point? My point is that our fight against our dissatisfaction is a, is a fight for our very lives. It, it really does matter what we do with our feelings of dissatisfaction uh, in our lives. The past four weeks in particular, we had Psalm 37, we spent two weeks there, and then we were in Psalm 49, and then last week Logan uh, was in Luke 16. And we have talked over and over. His sermon was 28 minutes, by the way. Uh, so uh, you guys can either keep inviting him back, but just know that I'm going to take the rollover minutes today. I'm joking. And add them into my, into my sermon. Uh, he talked about Luke uh, chapter 19 or 16 about the, uh, the man who was uh, sentenced or who had died and was asking Lazarus just to bring a drop of water and touch to my tongue. But the point is, and what we've gone over is that the world measures winning differently than God measures winning. The world measures success differently than than God measures success. And we have gone, I mean, for four weeks we've been there, and we've come at it from different angles, but this week it culminates. It 
culminates in a, in a place uh, where we have to acknowledge how easy it is for us, even as the children of God, to give up God's rubric for success and God's rubric for happiness and go after whatever the world may have to offer to us. We have to take ownership for that with uh, the man who wrote the 73rd Psalm, Asaph. Today we're going to watch him do that. He's going to take ownership of his dissatisfaction. He's going to repent of it. And, and as we watch it unfold, we're going to see that the world's promises of satisfaction will betray us. But God's promises never will. And when we turn to Jesus, we find him more than enough. And so we jump in, and this is where we're headed. I'm just going to read it. We'll come back. This is where he eventually finds himself, and this is the longing of my heart for, for all of us in this room, that this would be the testimony of our lives. He says, nevertheless, about God, I am continually with you. God, you hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterwards you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. That that level of satisfaction with who God is and what he has done will be the testimony of our lives. But Asaph had to get there. The psalmist had to get there. And we're going to see that promise today. This is a masculine. And honestly, I, I don't know what that is. And I read every, there There's no set agreement as to what that is. It's some sort of musical thing. Uh, it's a Hebrew word. It's a very obscure Hebrew word. Um, but obviously it has to do with, with music. It could be a word for a poem or, or some sort of, you know, specific rhythm at which they would uh, recite or sing this, this song. But the man who wrote it, his name is Asaph. He was a counterpart to David. And he has a, a handful of psalms. I think maybe seven or eight. This is the second one that appears in the book of Psalms. And he was a musician, a descendant of the tribe of Levi, but we don't know much else about him, except that he was obviously musically gifted and he served along David to lead the people towards knowing and loving God. And he's going to recount a very personal experience. He's going to be very authentic with us and open with us about his, his life today in this song. Here's where he starts. And what I want us to see in these first uh, 12 verses, and we're going to really rush through them. But the first three is where we'll kind of focus, is I want us to see Asaph owning the presence of his dissatisfaction. He's owning that there's dissatisfaction present in his life. He says, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant and I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Verse 3 tells us what the source of his slipping and his falling was. That he had looked at the wicked, that those around him who were arrogant, and, and the people we've looked at in the last four weeks, people who lived for themselves selfishly, who put, uh, stepped on other people to get where they wanted to get, were having success while those who were living righteously were uh, suffering, struggling. And there was a, a struggle, and there's a, still a struggle today to make congruence of that reality in this world. And what he says is, I looked at the arrogant, I looked at those who were successful through selfishness and greed, and I envied them. I wanted what they had. I wanted what uh, the success that they were experiencing. That's where he was at. But notice the contrast he makes in the very first verse. He says, truly, and that's a Hebrew word that could easily be translated always, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure of heart. To those who are truly the children of God, God isn't sometimes good. God doesn't get it right periodically. It's always, it's constant. So he compares himself, he contrasts himself to the constant goodness of God by saying, man, I don't, I'm not that way. In fact, very recently I've had a battle in my life with dissatisfaction. With wishing that I could have what the arrogant have. Wishing I could have what those who are selfishly successful have. And in that time, that envy got me all turned around. 
and my feet were slipping and I was stumbling, right? You ever seen those compilations of people, usually from further south, who've never experienced snow or ice, and they try to go out and move their garbage can or whatever, and they're like sliding all over the place. That's the idea. That his envy, his desire, his, his selfish desire, and his confusion about why following after God had not led to all of this good stuff, and why living sinfully had led to all this good stuff had left him turned around and all twisted up. And so that's where he, he finds himself. But listen to this, because uh, you've been there, I've been there, that place of being dissatisfied with our life. Maybe small parts of our life, maybe the entire thing. Where you just either look at something specific in your life and you say, that's not enough. I wish I had more here. And if you've been at a place where it's the whole thing, you're just like, this life, the whole lot, my whole life just feels like it's been a waste at this point. So be there and let's own the fact that that dissatisfaction is dangerous. Asaph is willing to do that. But at the same time, right, he takes ownership of that. So he's, or, or at, in the midst of it, he takes ownership of it. This is an important concept, and it's going to matter today. And it's something I talk with my kids about all the time, and it's something I have to talk to myself about all the time. That we must be people who take ownership for our own actions, for our own uh, things that are our responsibilities. And in particular, for our sin. We have to take ownership of that. We can't pass the buck. I have a friend, and I don't know why I thought of this. Oh, I do know why I thought of it. I have a friend in Uganda. Uh, his name's B-Dubs. And I saw a picture of him and another friend of mine, Tony, and they're like together, and they're like pointing at each other, you know? And Tony's pointing like this, but B-Dubs is pointing like this, like with his whole hand. And I'm like, what's he doing? That's weird. But, uh, and I haven't asked him yet. Next time I see him, I'll ask him, like, what in the world is this all about? But it made me think of my mom, and maybe you had a mother like this. Whenever I would point at somebody, like accuse them of something, she'd say, you know, well, one finger points at them, three fingers are pointing back at you. Anybody? Am I the only one that had a mom? But, okay. The point that she was trying to convey, though, is that I need to take ownership of my part of the mess. I need to take ownership of my responsibility in where we find ourselves. But instead, we so often like to, to do the B-dubs and make sure that none of the fingers are pointing back at ourselves. And so today, Asaph calls us to take ownership, but at the same time, he's not oblivious to his situation. He gives a bunch of verses, and we're not going uh, to dig into them because we've been digging into verses like this for the last four weeks. But he exp expresses his situation. He's not oblivious to where he's at. He's not pretending like there's nothing wrong. He says, for they, the evil, have no pangs until death. They live the good life. Their bodies are fat and sleek. <laughs> That's me coming back from the beach, by the way. I'm fat and sleek. That was a good thing back then. I don't know how good it is now. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. They get away with everything. Their life is easy. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Again, that sounds like a terrible thing. But again, the idea is that just they have everything. Like they, they've engorged themselves so much on everything they want that now even their eyes are getting getting fat. Their heart flows with follies. They scoff and speak with malice, lofty. Uh, loftily they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongues strut through the earth. Therefore, his people, this is the result. There are people who had been following God who now turn back to these successful, arrogant, wicked people and they find no fault in them. They look at their temporal success and say they must be getting it right. And they say, how can God know anything? Is there even knowledge in the Most High, behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. And again, like I said, we've read verses like that over and over and over again these past four weeks. It's a real struggle in this life to look at the success of others, especially those who gain it wickedly or gain it by cutting corners, and to be jealous and to wonder, should we be modeling our lives less like Jesus and more like these people, and he owns that. Asaph owns his situation in his circumstances. But listen, we can 
do both things that Asaph does. He's painting us a picture. He's taking ownership of his situations. He's not lying about it. But he's also taking ownership of how he responds to it. We tend to do one or the other. We tend to blame our circumstances, right? We just push everything off on them. Or we say, I'm going to just not even talk about it. I'm going to talk about my circumstances. I don't want anybody to think I'm making excuses. Asaph is balanced. So much of the Bible is about balance. He's able to own his situations and his circumstances. He's able to talk about them authentically while still taking ownership of his sin. We can do both. So now he moves from taking ownership of the presence of his dissatisfaction. So he says, I can see it in me. I'm dissatisfied. I'm yearning for something that I shouldn't be. And I'm dissatisfied with what I have. To now owning the false feelings of dissatisfaction. Watch this play out. He says some, uh, something that seems uh, uh, like heresy here. But we'll, we'll, we'll play it out together. All in vain have I kept my heart clean, he says, and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. What Asaph just did is he pulled back the veil and he showed you his heart. He showed you how he is feeling in this moment. And what he says is a lie. What he says is untrue. None of our labor, it, it'll be said by Paul the Apostle, none of your labor in Christ is in vain. Not a single bit of it. But that doesn't mean we don't feel that way sometimes. It doesn't mean we don't feel like we're just uh, uh, on a, a treadmill in our righteousness and nothing is changing around us and it's not making any, any difference. And so he lets you see his heart. But notice, too, that Asaph is going to recognize here in verse 15 that his feelings aren't telling him the truth. Do we own that today? That our feelings are not infallible. That doesn't mean our feelings are, are always wrong, but our feelings most certainly are not always right. And Asaph recognizes that. Asaph looks at his Feelings, and he doesn't ignore them, but he knows that because he's harboring dissatisfaction, that that is going to fuel his feelings to lie to him. Speak, uh, Pete Scazzaro, who is, wrote a book that we're reading as uh, in vegan training right now, said this in a podcast about his feelings. So his feelings are like children when you're driving to the beach. You'd be foolish to let them drive. But you'd be equally foolish to stuff them in the trunk of the car. Right? Like we just got back from the beach. We did neither of those things. We did not let the children drive. I don't know if I ever will. I'm just kidding. You get the drop eventually. But we also didn't like duct tape their hands and feet and like stuff them down where the stow and go seating goes either. Right? To just not be annoyed by them so we could have a little date time on the, on the drive down there. Both are illegal. And both are foolish. But we tend to have two uh, propensities when it comes to our emotions. We either submit to them, right? Like we treat them like they're the God of our life. And we're just a wreck following after our emotions wherever they lead us, right? If it makes you happy, it can't be that bad. Live your truth, right? If it feels good, do it. Follow your heart. Or, and a lot of people get more credit for this. Like they get, get seen maybe as a good thing in some circles. But it's not, and I've been there, we stuff those feelings down inside of us so that nobody can see them. Nobody knows they're there. We just push it down, suck it up. you got to be tough, right? That idea. But in the Bible, there's this biblical example over and over again, especially in the Psalms, of being able to simultaneously hold on to both things, to be real about how we feel, to be real about our emotions, to be real about our circumstances and situations, while at the same time clinging on to the true and faithful promises of God. Asaph is setting that example for us. Because when we're walking in step with the Spirit, our feelings are a lot more in step with what God wants. 
But when we're walking out of step with the Word of God, our feelings can be dangerous, dangerous liars. And so Asaph does something super important, models something super important for us. He understands that although he's being authentic about what he feels and he can voice his emotions, I mean, like he's laying himself bare in front of a bunch of people. We can at least do that with the people close to us. We can lay ourselves bare about what we're feeling and experiencing while at the same time being very, very, care very careful. He says, if I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. Here's what that verse means. He said, here's what I felt in the moment. Wrecked. I felt like it was all wasted. But I didn't say it out loud yet. Because I knew that the way I was going to say it was going to hurt me. And it was going to hurt those around me. Not just now, but for, for generations. Here's the point I want us to see. Right now... In our day and age, we can vomit our feelings so quickly onto social media, the internet. There's no reason, nothing holding us back. We can just do it. Put it out there. And in our day and age, and some of this is a really, really good thing, people are being empowered more and more to voice authentically what they're feeling and experiencing. And we need, we need more spaces where people can, can do that. But we as the people of God must be careful. Here's what I mean. When we talk about our feelings of hopelessness, and we should be able, those of you who feel hopeless today, it is my prayer that there are Christians in your life that you can talk about that hopelessness with those people and feel safe and loved and seen and known. But may we not in those moments forget to also talk about the reality of hope that is biblically present for the children of God. When we talk about our frustration and our anger, and we should be able to discuss those things with people in our lives, may we not forget the biblical realities of reconciliation and forgiveness. Might we be able to hold both things simultaneously as the children of God? When we talk about our depression and our anxiety, and might we have more and more spaces in our churches where people can talk about their emotional health openly? vulnerably, safely. But when we do, might we not forget the biblical realities of joy and peace. You see, we as the people of God, and it's the biblical example of the Psalms, and if you want to see this done time and time again, read the Psalms, where you will see psalmist after psalmist deeply talk about their despair and their sadness and their brokenness and their grief and they almost sound schizophrenic at times because then they'll immediately begin to talk about the hope and the surety of God's promises in the same psalm. That's what we're called to as the people of God. I think of 1 Thessalonians 4.13. We do not want you to be uninformed brothers about those who are asleep. He's talking about what happens after death but it applies to what we're talking about today. That you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. That's not a verse about not grieving. That's a verse that's saying grieve. But when you grieve, we grieve differently as the children of God. We grieve as people who have hope. So the point is not that we're robots about our emotions. Not that we're robots about our grief. It's just that we grieve differently. With our emotions, we're not robots either. We're hope-filled suckers. So might we hold rightly where our emotions go as children of God? Can't stuff them in the trunk. Can't let them drive. But they matter. And it matters that we keep them where they are. And Asaph shows us that example, and I'm thankful for it. But now he comes to the hinge. He's been authentic, right, about the presence of dissatisfaction in his life. He's been authentic about the false feelings that dissatisfaction has brought into his life. And now... He comes to a hinge. He says, in my mind, when I thought about how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. Also instructive, by the way. Because not only did following after God not feel right, it didn't logically make sense to him, but yet, while it's logically incongruent for him, and it feels 
like the wrong thing to him, he's still clinging to the truth of God's promises. That's instructive. It wasn't just his heart, right? Like his, his emotional center that he kind of had to, to keep at bay. He also had to keep his mind at bay too because his mind was trying to make sense of it and it couldn't. Now he hasn't gotten to the place yet because he's just acknowledged a couple things. He says, my emotions were wrecking me in this moment. My despair, my dissatisfaction was wrecking me and I almost talked about it, but I didn't. It would have hurt the community too if I had. But I talked about it when I wanted to, the way I wanted to. It would have hurt the community around me. He says, in that moment, right, like in, in, in that time, I knew that I was slipping, that I needed to, to course correct. So what does he do? But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until, this is the hinge, I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. Here's the point. And we've seen this, and he's going to proclaim it here in just a second, that the end for the wicked, right, we've seen that truth, is not uh, happy. It's not glorious. It's not good. It doesn't include all the wealth and, and health that they have right now. But where did he see it? He saw it in the presence of God, with the people of God. Under the knowledge of God, might we be the same? When we notice our hearts wandering, might we return to the people of God? May we return to the presence of God? Might we return to the knowledge of God? That's what he does. He rushes there into the presence of God. That's the hinge. And watch the results of the hinge. The first thing that the knowledge of God in the presence of God with the people of God is going to bring to him is a clarity for his mind. His mind was in disarray. Because of his dissatisfaction, the clarity is going to come. And then we're also going to see satisfaction come to his heart in the presence of God. He says this, Truly, you have set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. We've seen this argument. We're not going to, we're not going to spend time hashing out those verses. We've seen this for four weeks. Here's the point in a sentence. The specific truth is that the world foolishly measures success in the now, temporally, but God perfectly measures success in light of eternity, and only God's measurement is correct. That's the clarity that was brought for Asaph when he was with the people of God in the presence of God under the knowledge of God. The reason I'm dissatisfied, Asaph realized, is because I'm measuring it the wrong way. I'm counting the wrong way. My rubric is wrong. And I need to align my understanding of success and winning with God's. And so he does. But today, instead of noticing what the argument is, I want you to notice where he found it. He found the clarity of that argument with the people of God. He found the clarity of that argument in the presence of God, with God. The knowledge of God. And so that deeply matters. If you're seeking clarity of mind today, you're actually in the right place. With the people of God. Under the knowledge of God, with the presence of God. Not only does it bring clarity of mind to us when we go into the presence of God. When we know God. But it brings satisfaction to our hearts. That's the other result that happens... But before he gets to that, he makes one last interjection. He says, when my soul, this is a confession, very authentic one. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast towards you. He says that to God. Now, here he's owning the sinfulness of his dissatisfaction. And what had happened was he started the psalm, he said, owning the presence of dissatisfaction. And then he moved into owning the false feelings of dissatisfaction. And then you think he would have just owned the sinfulness of his dissatisfaction. So it could all kind of balance out before the hinge. But instead he goes to the hinge. He says, man, what brought me to clarity was being in the presence of God, with the people of God, under the knowledge of God. That's where I needed to be. But now he goes back to owning something again, right? It kind of seems out of order. But here's my theory. Because what he's doing is repenting. 
And where repentance happens is in the presence of God, with the people of God, under the knowledge of God. And so when he encounters the people of God, right, before he had just been talking about his dissatisfaction's impact on himself, and possibly the community around him, now he moves into talking about its impact on his relationship with God. And he repents of it. I don't want this to sound harsh. Dissatisfaction is a cancer. It is a saboteur. And it's viral. It'll spread to those around you. But what is more important today to understand is this. That when I, I'll throw myself under the bus. When I harbor dissatisfaction, not when I just feel it like an inclination to dissatisfaction, but when I actually harbor it, when I let it maul over in my mind, when I refuse to fight back against my dissatisfaction, that's sin. That's hard. You have to hear what I'm saying. I'm not saying that if that's a daily battle for you, you're in sin. What I'm saying is when we give up, when we come to the point where we're going to say, my dissatisfaction tells the truth, not God telling the truth. That's sin. For the children of God to come to a place where they say, Whew. now I say that with grace and gentleness. I say that as a sinner who, who comes to Jesus for grace and peace and forgiveness and, and even in my sinfulness I'm loved and received and I say that as someone who has walked through long seasons of dissatisfaction and done nothing to fight against it, nothing to push back. I say that as someone who stands ready to talk with you and walk with you through your dissatisfaction in this life. But we must fight against it. We must push back against our dissatisfaction. And here he feels the need to repent. He says, in my dissatisfaction, it led me to act like a beast towards God. My actions were changed by my dissatisfaction, and I pushed back against God as if I was a beast. But here's the good news. In the presence of God, his heart is satisfied. Verse 23, nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. Don't miss that in verse 22, he was acting like a beast towards God. And in verse 23, he's walking hand in hand with his creator. That no matter, right, the depth of my wrongness, the depth of my dissatisfaction, the depth of my sin, the father reaches out his hand to his children and says, walk with me. Stay close to me. And he meets the repentant sinner where they are and walks with them. Verse 24, you guide me with your counsel and afterward you will receive me to glory. For the child of God, there is strength for today and the counsel of God and there is bright hope for tomorrow. He will receive us to glory. Verse 25, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing in this world that I desire besides you. You see, his heart is being transformed. He is being renewed in his spirit to measure rightly what it means to be satisfied. To measure rightly what it means to be content. He's having a complete shift, right? And it reminded me of that often taken out of context kind of J.R.R. Tolkien uh, poem from the Fellowship of the Ring. All that is gold does not glitter, right? Like he's having a change of what he sees. Not all those who wander are lost. The old that is strong does not wither. Deep roots are not reached by the frost. Right? Like this is a character that's, that's kind of beginning to recognize that there is an alternate reality that's the true reality beyond what we can see with our eyes. From the ashes there's future hope. A fire shall be woken. A light from the shadows shall spring. Renewed shall be blade that is broken. The crownless again shall be king. Asaph is seen beyond his reality to the promises of God. He's seen beyond his dissatisfaction to the satisfaction that is his in the presence of God. Everything that earth, this earth has to offer, he says, is not worthy of my uh, love and affection. It's not what I desire most. What I desire is God. There's nothing in heaven 
that I desire more than God. He's regained his kingdom rubric. And then he says this, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. The word here is helek, proportion. It was a word that the Levites, right, that tribe of Jacob, the, Le, uh, the tribe of Levi, would have understood very clearly. When they came into the promised land, there were 12 tribes of Israel, and 11 of them got portions of land in that place. But the tribe of Levi did not. Instead, they served in the temple, and the promise to them was that Yahweh will be your helik. Yahweh will be your helik. Your portion will be God. He will be your satisfaction. He will be your inheritance. Listen, I thought of this this week, right? The, the world around us, they may get their portion like in those giant Speedway mugs. Remember, you know those ones, right? Like 85,000 ounces or whatever. They may get their portion in like uh, flower planter size like punch bowls. While the children of God may get their portion in tiny little mason jars. Tiny little bottles. Do you remember the widow in 1 Kings chapter 17? She had a little bottle of oil and a little jar of flour, and there was only enough left in it to make one more cake. And so she made it for her son, and then she said, we're going to curl up and die. That was the end. They were in the midst of a famine. And remember, Elijah steps in. And by God's grace, he says, you know what's going to happen every time you go back to that tiny little jar and that tiny little bottle, it's never going to be empty. And it came true. She kept making cakes for her son and for herself every single day because she always had enough. That's the portion God gives. It may not look flashy externally, but internally it will always be enough. It's a there at the right time portion. <coughs> It's an inexhaustible portion. It's a more than enough portion. One time that same prophet Elijah, in the midst of despair, depression, and suicidal ideations under a broom tree in the wilderness, was there about to give up on ministry and life. And God came to him with a small cake and a jar of water. And he came to him twice in grief. And it may have seemed meager, meager, kind, but meager. Especially when you know he's got a 40-day journey ahead of him. But what you read next is that he goes this to 40 days and 40 nights in the strength of that cake and that water. Because it was enough. What God gives his children will always, always, always be enough. You can be satisfied completely with what God has given to you. It's not easy. Because around us, there's so much that we're going to desire and want. I'm guilty of it. But the world measures wrongly. God measures rightly. And what God gives is always more than enough. You see, God gives a more than enough portion to his less than adequate children because it's an I know better than you do what you need portion. What God does. So might we prioritize knowing God? Might we desire nothing in this world, nothing in this universe more than walking hand in hand with God? Might we prioritize his guidance over all other guidance in this world? And might we look forward to that day when he receives us to glory? Might Yahweh be our helik, our portion? Might God be our portion in the good times and the bad times? And even when our soul and our body waste away. And we come to that final day. Might he still be our portion. All the way to the end. From today until death. The final two verses are our application. Because the question we're left with is which one testifies to, to who you are. Are you found in verse 27 or are you found in verse 28? Verse 27 says, For behold those who are far off from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, you're not a follower of Jesus, that's the end for you, but it doesn't happen. 
There's another great verse that I would venture everyone in this room knows, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish. Perishing doesn't have to be your end, but instead it can be eternal life. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, and you'll be saved. You see, Jesus took what should have been your portion, the wrath of God against sin. Every one of those. And on the cross, he drank all of that cup of God's wrath on our behalf. He took your portion so that we could have his portion. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And, and if you are, then verse 28 becomes your testimony. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. That's our application. First, keep coming near to God. That will require repentance. You're going to have to, to take ownership of, of your sin and, your, and the things that distract you or, or keep you away from that. And I didn't realize that, that Logan had you all make a list last week. But your homework assignment today, part one, would be to make a list of the places where you're dissatisfied. What things in your life give you that sense of dissatisfaction? Where is it that you're wanting more? Where is it that you tend to not be satisfied with what God's given to you? Maybe you have to look into the past to be reminded of times when that was true. Maybe you can look into the now and see it. Write those things down. Maybe during communion, maybe during uh, some time with God tomorrow morning, write down what are you dissatisfied with? Where are these points of dissatisfaction in your life? There's your template. For repentance, bring that to God for forgiveness and for strength to overcome. Second line of the verse says, the Lord God is my, I made, I made the Lord God my refuge. Might we do the same? Might we stay near the presence of God with the people of God in the knowledge of God? And if today, right, you need refuge because you sense yourself wandering away from the people of God and the presence of God, then, then go back. We got this put on a blanket that we had made for Abraham. It's actually really nice. It's like stitched in. It's a, it's a song that a man named Andrew Peterson wrote for his son as he was pre preparing to leave, leave the nest. He said, I know you'll be scared when you take up that cross, and I know it'll hurt because I know what it costs. And I love you so much, and it's so hard to watch, but you're going to grow up, and you're going to get lost. You're going to wander away from the people of God and the presence of God and the knowledge of God. So what do you do when you find yourself there? He says, go back. Go back. To the ancient paths. Lash your heart to the ancient mast. Hold on, boy, whatever you do, to the hope that's taken hold of you. And you'll find your way. You'll find your way back home. Make God your refuge. Today, if you're wandering from his presence, if you're in a season of dissatisfaction, where your feet are stumbling, where your feelings are lying to you, where you're sinning and even acting like a beast towards God, go back. He will receive you with open arms, loving arms today. And then lastly, tell of his works. It's the last line of verse 28 that I may tell of your works. So part two, on one part of the homework, you wrote the things, the places that you're tempted towards dissatisfaction on the other piece, right? What you're thankful for. And not just stuff, right? That's those things too, but evidence of grace. How has God changed your life? What are the things you used to be angry about, but now you're satisfied? What are the things you used to be addicted to, but now your, your uh, hope is in Christ? What are these ways that he has changed your life? Write those down, and then that's your template for, for telling others. Tell the people of God. Tell your brothers and sisters in Christ. Might we this week even sit with one another in different places and tell of, of what God has done to change our lives and tell it to the least, the last, and the lost. Proclaim it to those who don't know Christ. That we have a God, right, who can satisfy. The world's promises of satisfaction will betray us, but God's promises never will. Proclaim that to those who don't know Jesus, that when they turn to Jesus, they will find him to be more been enough. And might we proclaim it to one another as well. Father, 
I need that. We all need that. My propensity is towards dissatisfaction, but you are more than enough. Asaph realized that. Might I realize that. Might we all realize that. And may our hearts be changed because of that reality. So in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening. And if you haven't already, we would love for you to join the work of God as Jesus builds Mercy Village Church. You can learn more at our website at www.mercyvillage.church.